Θα προχωρήσουμε ε, με τον επόμενο μιλητή και μετά τις ερωτήσεις μας στο τέλος. Ε, λοιπόν, θα παρουσιάσω τον Κόρνελ Σβερλάιν, ο οποίος είναι ετέρος του Πανεπιστημίου του Bamberg ε, με την υποτροφία Heisenberg. Ε, διδάσκει ιστορία των πρώιμων ε, νέων χρόνων και περιβαλλοντική ιστορία ε, από το 2008 στο Πανεπιστήμιο Bochum και εποπτεύει διδακτορικές διατριβές στο Πανεπιστήμιο του Μονάχου. Ε, το 2011 έγινε υφηγητής. Ε, έχει πάρει υποτροφίες από Γαλλία, Ιταλία και Γερμανία και οι δημοσιεύσεις του εμφανίζονται σε όλες αυτές τις γλώσσες όπως και στα αγγλικά. Έχει διατελέσει ε, τέρος και συνεργάτης στο Harvard και στο Wolfson College στο Cambridge. Συνεργάζεται με τον καθηγητή Alan Μικαήλ στο Yale, ο οποίος έχει τιμηθεί με ε, βραβείο Ανελίεζε Μάιερ του Ιδρύματος Humboldt. Η εργασία του, η, τα βιβλία του και τα άρθρα του επικεντρώνονται πάνω σε οικονομικά, θρησκευτικά, πολιτικά, θεωρητικά θέματα που αφορούν την Ευρώπη του 16ου, 17ου, 18ου και 19ου αιώνα και επίσης ενδιαφέρεται πολύ για τον μοντερνισμό και το globalization. Τα τελευταία του βιβλία επικεντρώνονται στην Μεσόγειο, όπως uh, Imperial Unknowns, the French and the British in the Mediterranean, 1650 to 1750, The Dark Side of Knowledge, Histories of Ignorance, 1400 to 1800, και Fruits of Migration, Heterodox Italian Migrants and Central European Culture, 1550 to 1620. Η ανακοίνωσή του διερεύνα τον τρόπο με τον οποίο η ταξιδιωτική γραμματεία της Δύσης επέδρασε στον τρόπο με τον οποίο η περιοχή του Λεβάντε είχε ερμηνευθεί από τους Ευρωπαίους. Ευχαριστώ. Κορνέλ, it's your turn now. Thank you very much uh, to the president and the chair. Thank you very much also to Hura um, Hatsi Panagioti for this very nice uh, invitation. It's my first time in Cyprus, so um, different from the speaker from yesterday. I'm very much new and I'm very much uh, Uh, surprised by the hospitality here and thank you so much for that yesterday I uh, forgot uh, hu hurrying out from the uh, from the airport in the taxi my my phone in the taxi driver and the taxi driver brought it immediately back to the hotel so <laughs> Cyprus is a wonderful place <laughs> so the collection of travel literature presented and already analyzed on the Sephiroth platform betrays basically two different approaches to describe the island many are rather antiquarian uh, uh, or use and geohistorical form of descriptions where men and women of the present time either do not play a large role or the authors give summaries and narratives from ancient authors since Herodotus. The other part of the accounts are really early modern travel accounts concentrating on the present state of affairs stemming from the personal autopsy of the travelers not always but often written in first person narrative form. So in the following, I will rather concentrate on that latter part, uh, on accounts concerning the, the present state of affairs. Um, insisting on the fact that mostly those travelers are describing how they use the infrastructure of the European consulates on the island as point of arrival, even as their hosting and lodging houses, from where they eventually depart for little journeys through the island, returning then to Larnaca. In the second step, I will compare this, these descriptions with what we know or what could be known today from archive sources concerning the European Consulate, just to make a little bit of measuring between what is in the text which are printed and what is in the archives about the same uh, reality of Cyprus. Thirdly, I will take a look on a particular source, the probatory records of dead or bankrupt merchants, mostly from the English, to ask for how travel literature and other historical geographical descriptions of the Levant were present in the European libraries in the Levant themselves. So I'm just coming from outside and looking uh, where the travel accounts are to be found eventually in the libraries of those who were in the early modern times in the Mediterranean themselves, just to check if that what is now a virtual library of Uh, Cyprus related literature was also present at that time in the libraries of the readers of that time. While the medieval descriptions like Mandeville could only point vaguely to um, 
Christian merchants on the island that had been expelled. Many early 16th century and 17th uh, century uh, early modern narratives do not play much attention. Do not pay much attention to the European nations. Sandys in 1610 is mentioning only the Franks uh, in general, but betrays no knowledge of already well constituted merchant nations. Why, for other places, he notes well the consul if existent. However, Henri uh, Beauvais is mentioning as early as 1608 the Echelle of Cyprus in the form we are normally used to read of only after the Richelieu and the Colbert reforms. So the Echelle is normally just a description which then is used over uh, the whole 17th and 18th century for the French nations abroad in the Mediterranean. And he's using that very early before the Richelieu and Colbert reforms. So there must be already uh, have been something like an infrastructure and the um, a mercantilist perception of Cyprus being included into a network of French mercantilist economy, just at the time when Henri IV and Sully were doing their financial reforms, and just at the time when Montchrétien Mon was uh, doing something like a palimpsest of a Buddha uh, uh, with regard to economics. Otherwise, we have, during the whole 17th century, century not so much, not so much uh, mentions of uh, the f uh, French nations and the British nations abroad on Cyprus. Uh, Dandini or Laffey are quite heavily biased by their own proto-national view. However, it is remarkable that in one of the most important and successful works by a famous Levant merchant, uh, Louis Roberts, The Map of Commerce, um, <coughs> Cyprus is nearly absent with the exceptions of a short page on the island as a trading place. Roberts had published this in 1638 when ev evidently no English nation was established on the island. However, this held, held true also for other trading places, which he nevertheless described quite extensively and as an apprentice of the company he had traveled himself through the Greek islands as Zante Cephalonia uh, and to Ithaca in 1619 to 1624. So he knew very well the place and he looked in every island in the Mediterranean where he went to very, very good about what is the customs record, what is the exchange rates, uh, what goods are sold and so on. So this merchant map of commerce was for the 17th and 18th century, something like the Bible of the Levant Company. And the small uh, page he is uh, just devoting to Cyprus shows that in 1638 at least, or in the 1620s, Cyprus was not yet included so much into the big infrastructure of the Levant Company, which was just growing after the end of the English nation, the 1578, uh, 1581. More information about the consular and merchant network on Cyprus and between Cyprus is emerging during the times of the Seven Years' War from 1754 to 1768, so uh, in a jump uh, through the time with Drummond, Plaisted, Eve, Egmont, Hyman, and then the most detailed Mariti. Now at Cyprus, the English consul was George Wakeman, who died in 1757, and I will come back to him later. Wakeman's successor, Timothy Turner, in dead in 1768, is mentioned by Mariti. Mariti's work devotes quite detailed descriptions uh, to the establishment, the offices, and the functions of the consuls, first of all, the French on Cyprus. At that point, no authoritative publication or published legislation on the French consular office after the Colbertian reforms was existing in France. So Mariti is quite a precious source, even as a printed source at least, for a French the French history of the consular system. Uh, if we take just the question, what is Mariti adding to this uh, from the Severus uh, platform? Mariti is insisting on the quite straight accord and harmony between the European consuls on the island. When they are negotiating with the Ottomans, which uh, were stressing also Egmont Hyman in 1559 as a specific character of Cyprus, uh, different from Smyrna and other trading places, where indeed usually the nations and consuls were performing competition against each other concern the customs, percentages, and other privileges with the Ottoman governors, while on Cyprus there's harm harmony. And the harmony is not just a niceness because they are uh, compelled to uh, uh, act in harmony uh, to negotiate the silk trade together. So uh, Mariti is uh, just stressing that as a particular uh, instance of the consular uh, relationship on, on Cyprus. In fact, during two centuries, the offices of the different consuls, Dutch, Venetian, Tusk, and British, were often distributed among the existing foreign consuls, the French one often combining the Dutch and the English consulate in his person in earlier times. Later, other combinations proved better fitting 
to the current political context, and I will come back to something like that later. And that's what I could read and find in the Cephris platform sources as <coughs> printed evidence on the consular system and the uh, foreign merchants on Cyprus. And I want now uh, to start to compare that a little bit with what we know from the archivist sources. For well, the French presence in Cyprus, uh, the archive sources are by far surpassing the British records. Large parts of the consular correspondence starting in 1670 in the relevant subseries of the Archive National have been edited by Anna Pouradier du Télusidou, and much correspondence and other records are also preserved in the archives of the Chambre de Commerce in Marseille and the Archive des Affaires étrangères in Nantes. Of the early times, when the consulate was formally established, the dispatches by François Luce are containing very detailed information, not always to be found in similar <coughs> consular correspondences for the other Echelle in the Mediterranean, on the composition of the nation in 1698-1699, the annual expenses by the consulate. Of interest is also an early survey of the Echelle by Benoit de Maillet, Benoit de Maillet, who was a very important early clandestine uh, Enlightenment writer who was uh, building up uh, a geological uh, treatise, which is uh, also a little bit anti-biblical in, uh, in its outline. So that is his partisan intellectual. But uh, in public life, he was one of the most learned members of the Marseille-based consular network and dynasties and was charged in 1718 by the Versailles administration and the Chambre de Commerce as inspector with the survey of all the Echelle, and a part of this for Cyprus has also survived, dating probably from the very end of 1718, which gives a precious overview on the French trade balance for the Cypriot commerce for the years 1708 to 1717, and even some information on the early development of that Echelle. When Luce describes the nation in detail in 1698-1699, it was composed of 17 houses, maisons, meaning enterprises and commercial societies based on formal partnership contracts. Some of the houses were led just by one patron, most of them by two joint partners, all in all 26 principal merchants are named. <coughs> Next to the usual strong Marseille part, which is the normal case in all French Mediterranean settlements, for Cyprus, the fraction from La Ciotat uh, was especially strong, and both parts belonged apparently to the founding houses of the colony. Several non-Marseille um, uh, houses were described by Consulus to have had affinities even to the English competitor, which was noted with a strong sense of annoyment toward Versailles. So I marked that with the... Uh, with the lines which are going towards Livorno, and there's written uh, that uh, Dominique Jonas, for example, has bad relationships with the English in Livorno. Uh, and this uh, Dominique uh, Jonas was from Pigna, close to Nice, a Savoyard naturalized Frenchman uh, who was probably uh, collaborating with an English merchant as Livorno. This is Dominique Jonas, who has written also a magnifique two volume history on Cyprus uh, after he uh, came back into the uh, service of uh, the Empress Maria Theresia. And, but let's go back to the, uh, to the nation. The Marseille nations seem to have been therefore more faithful in proto-nationally French than this naturalized Savoyard Dominique uh, 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 Jonas. Three houses from La Ciotat, Pigna and Marseille were also linked by the common Marinid father-in-law, who was, um, uh, they all married the daughter of the leader of the local Maronite uh, group, uh, Papa Petros. Uh, so this is Papa Petros, and he has three daughters, and they are married to three Frenchmen coming to uh, the nation. <coughs> and it was very good for them, because they earned uh, by the endowment much of their starting capital on Cyprus. So twice they got 20,000 écu, and once 25,000 écu, and largely their capital, which had been, uh, which was largely their, their real capital with, with which they started here, because in, co in comparison what they had when they came was uh, just a tenth of that. Grégoire, for example, had just a capital of 2,000 EQ. Uh, <coughs> so, um, well, with the exception of five merchants, uh, all merchants and also the members of the consulate were between 25 and 45 
years old. If being married, they were normally married with daughters or sisters within the French community itself, or had left their wives in the hometowns, sometimes since 20 years. But normally, they married only when they came back to Marseille or to London after the age of 45. Of the 26 members of the nation mentioned in 1699, only 10 had been at least seven years on Cyprus, and only three uh, had been there longer than nine years. One early member still in partnership with Cyprus had returned to Marseille. Four members of the colonies were married with Marinites, as I said, and I will uh, come back to that. But as a general characterization, we can say the merchant colony existed therefore in 1698-99, about 30 years after its establishment, only a Frenchman staying there for a given period, a short period uh, of their life, becoming partner of a maison after the apprenticeship, around the age of 25, and usually departing back home after their mid-40s to finally marry in Marseille and settle their business there. The Marinid community of Cyprus was small but important, was establishing another important link to the mainland. Marinid clergymen born on Cyprus like Andreas Kandar, Michele Metostita, and the Marinid uh, Archbishop of Cyprus, Stephanos Duwai, uh, Petros Maklov, uh, Gabriel Eva were central figures during all the confessional religious conflicts of the Marinid and the Melkite schisms of the 1710s and 1730s. Uh, so this was a link which was always a religious link, uh, by, which you know all better than me, uh, between Cyprus and, uh, uh, and, uh, and Syria and uh, the, the hinterland of, of Aleppo. Uh, while uh, this was not only just a religious entanglement, but also a commercial entanglement, because the Marinids were also at the same time very uh, strong in business. And uh, so what is... Uh, starting here with that intermarriage in a certain way, is a win-win situation between the French and the Marinids. Intermarriage was a, a capital investment for the French, and it was vice versa investment in protection by the Marinids, who profited from the French protection of their Catholic churches against the jurisdiction of the uh, 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 Greek schismatic Archbishop of Nicosia in that time. When in 1738 the mastermind of the congregation of the Propaganda Fide, as well as the Santo Ficio, the uh, Maronite Giuseppe Simani, was returning from the large synod of the Monte Liban through the other Levan places, it was necessary to strongly admonish that no marriage between the Marinids and schismatic Greeks, uh, <coughs> uh, or worse, with Muslims, should be allowed. This is another reason, on the Marinite side, why a marriage with a French merchant was a good solution through the candidate was perhaps far, though the candidate was perhaps far poorer in financial terms than the Marinite family. So Alexandre Grégoire coming to Papa Petros, can I marry your daughter? Uh, uh, for the Marinites, there was also an interest, though perhaps Alexandre Grégoire was quite poor. One could say the French colony was to a good extent founded with Marinid money, and probably the large rise of the French silk, take, uh, silk trade around and after 1700, of which the trade balances in the 1780s uh, survey are giving testimony, is due also to those links, though the silk was mainly produced on Cyprus itself. However, if one would take five to seven year cuts, probably at each cut half of the community of the French nation would be exchanged. Only some members had found it profitable to stay long on the island. This was producing to some extent the homogeneity uh, of its Frenchness upheld for decades. And this is a little bit the same for the English. Uh, and I stress that to, um, to characterize a little bit the, uh, the foreigner the foreign situation of the French and the English and their Frenchness and Englishness on Cyprus to come back then in the end to the library they possessed to understand how they were using rather probably Fran uh, French and British sources in their libraries uh, than uh, Oriental ones, though they, the nation itself stayed for uh, such a long time here. As we learned from my year's survey between 1708 and 1717, this French merchant colony was moving and serving goods on 129 ships from Marseille and Italy to the island and back from Cyprus to Marseille on 158 and on 38 ships to Italy together with 800,088, 443.23 livres. So this is very exact uh, uh, numbers which we have in the archives of Maillet. 
And the export of Cyprus it was the large share on that, nearly three quarters of the export was uh, the Cyprus silt, so uh, roughly 70,000 livre in those uh, 10 years. I just put that on the table to say, in comparison to the travel accounts, it is evident that the archival records enable a fine-grained insight into the realities of that French establishment in Cyprus, which is, uh, apologize, I don't want to uh, scale down the importance of uh, Seferis, I will come back to that. I just want to compare the types of sources. Uh, so this is never matched in the printed text. Not even one name of the French merchants, as given by Luce, can be found in the printed text of that time, as far as I see. One could not reconstruct such a one-year snapshot of the French nation as just done here for 1698-99 by any of the printed texts. This is important in so far as it teaches us much about what those texts do contain and what they do not. It teaches us about the form, the closure, the patterns of the textuality of early modern travel accounts and descriptions as a separate genre of printed text. And uh, Julia Khatsapir Panagioti uh, knows that better than me, that it is also a text genre and, and not just reality uh, uh, crafted uh, in those texts. They are often produced by people who even would have had or had access to manuscript records like the one we can still use today. Besides just technical reasons, size and price of a publishable book, this is probably to be understood not necessarily as a form of auto-censorship of information that what was at, at their hand or a code of decency not to name too many living persons which might lose importance soon after a book was published, but also as something like the effect of the implicit genre rules of such early modern travel accounts, establishing a certain distance to the realities, doing oblivion and transforming the con concrete into the more abstract and general was part of the writing rules of that genre. Let us take a short look on the British side. Here, <coughs> archival transmission is different. While good parts of the local records of the Aleppo factory, mainly its chancery records and many letter, uh, letters from Aleppo do uh, survive, for Cyprus we don't have that in general. Uh, I could detail on that, but in general we don't have much on Cyprus for the British side. But we know from other sources that the Venetian and the French run that, at least in 1721, we know from extra copies surviving in the Venetian documents that the consul Harvey Pretty was maintaining an own chancery on Cyprus for the <coughs> Levant merchants, of which in 1721-23 only Cook, George Treadway and jo uh, Joseph Smith are named, the chancellor being Demetrio Constantin, who would still serve in 1745 uh, to the re-established Venetian consul as chancellor. Therefore, in terms of a traditional positive estimate of source value, different for the French part of the story, uh, uh, the printed descriptions of Drummond, Placed, Eve, Egmont, Heyman, and Mariti, which are found in the Severus platform, can claim to be unreplaceable as such by now remaining archival records and help us to reconstruct for a different period, the large decade from 1754 uh, to 1768, the realities of the British establishment for which we don't have the archival records like for the French one on the island, while for earlier times all information would have to be gained in a puzzle work from fragments to be derived from the London letters and from the French and Venetian sources. From the diaries of George Boddington, we learned several details about that moment around 1700, which was for the British apparently similarly important as for the French. George Boddington was the principal of the Levant merchant dynasty. His brother Thomas had managed for a long time the common business in Aleppo, dying there in 1680. And when his own children grew up that he had with Hannah Steele, uh, so Hannah Boddington, one of his daughters, was married to Robert Wakeman, and with Robert Wakeman, a dynasty of Cyprus consul was starting. They had a child named George. Robert Wakeman was first going together with George Boddington's son Isaac to Aleppo in 1706, and when Robert uh, go, uh, went bankrupt, uh, uh, he was fortunate to become consul in Cyprus. Uh, I don't know if th this is an up or a down, <laughs> but... Uh, at least he came in 1707 to Cyprus and he died immediately <laughs> in 1708. 
If George Wakeman, so the more important person is George Wakeman, because we have the library record of him, so I have to prepare that a little bit. So his son, uh, George Wakeman, was already in the 1730s in uh, uh, Cyprus, remains unclear, but in 1742 he was already consul and was also named Venetian Vice Consul, acting in 1744 also as a factor of the Red Cliffs uh, uh, and so on. Alexander Drummond, one of the authors of the Sephiris platform, visited the island two years later in 1746, when Wakeman was well recognized as consul, struggling now with Venetians who had re-established their own consul, and for some time Wakeman claimed still rights from uh, his former dignity as Venetian vice consul, which was only settled in 1748. Uh, and he was still living with the Boddington here on Cyprus together. Drummond undertook during this, his second stay on Cyprus in 1750 a tour together with him into the hinterland of the island when they were suspected to be Venetian spies uh, because they were drawing sketches of the harbour. The British first drugman Antonio Cruta has then to explain the interest of an innocent learned traveller. And from that time must date the manuscript map of Cyprus by Alexander Drummond, one of the uh, authors of the uh, the Sephiroth platform, given to George Wakeman, my hero in this case, as a gift that has survived in the collection of the Museo Cora at Venice. Not much else concerning the size, structure, membership and cultures of the English community on Cyprus can be drawn from German, nor from the French or Venetian sources. When placed it, another author of the Sephiroth platform, in the service of the East India Company, arrived in the same year, 1750, on the island, he <coughs> um, He's criticizing that Wakeman was exercising the consular functions for the English, the Dutch, and the Venetians at the same time, and place it as a traveler who explicitly recognizes the importance of the consular infrastructure for men and goals uh, like this. A journey, this is not on this slide, a journey of this length through so many countries and people must have been intraportal if I had not met with so many English gentlemen whose good nature and hospitality made me almost forget the hardships if I had undergone. I was 45 days with Mr. Savage at Gombrun, 54 with Mr. Pomfret at Bussara, 7 days with Mr. Pollard at our consulate at Aleppo, and 8 with Mr. Wakeman, a uh, consul at Cyprus. So a voyage at that time is describing his voyage rather as a voyage from one consul to the other, from India to Cyprus, as uh, voyaging in one infrastructure. And Eve's description, who is also from the East India Company, uh, is the most attentive concerning the merchant communities in Aleppo and Cyprus, as you see here. He's listing even uh, the whole uh, community at that time. More interesting in general is, however, with Eve and with Placid, that they show how at this point the consular and the company's network had grown into a part of the early global British Empire. Eve is traveling together with the merchant Dodge Pie Pidget, who had also several tasks to fulfill for the East India Company at London's Ministry of Foreign Affairs with the board of the company and concerning the settlement of the affairs of the deceased Admiral Watson. Later, they were joined still by other uh, East India Company merchants, uh, uh, and then voyaging from Cyprus to Livorno. This is different for the English. We could not see something like that for the French part of the story, where normally there's no Indian-French connection like that, as it is for the English who are just voyaging across Suez and uh, then uh, uh, to Cyprus, uh, 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 as we see here. Early in the 18th century, the Levant Company and the East India Company, and I have to remember that, uh, had still fought hot battles in London concerning the proper priorities in the general directions of British global trade. So one could, at a first instance, be a little bit surprised that here East India Company merchants are happily visiting the Levant Company merchants and, uh, and, and peaceful uh, uh, dining with them together while they are fighting uh, uh, hot battles uh, in the Parliament in London. Basically, the Levant Company stood always for an older form of mercantilism based on the closed regulated company form, still linked to the traditions of a corporation with highly limited access, each merchant acting under the company's public and state-like protection on his own accounts, while the East India Company represented the modern model of capital <coughs> and joint stock investment, so uh, one could 
just invest into the East India Company, not doing trade uh, on your own uh, half. The risk was just the risk of the whole company for a joint stock uh, company like the East India Company. When the Levan Company, uh, the company was just organizing the shipping, but the risk was taken on by the Levant merchants themselves, uh, each on his own account. So. The battle between those, and here I just uh, show uh, the thing of Chelsea uh, the child, shows that there was a, a, a large um, dispute in uh, about 1710, 1730, uh, uh, just about silk trade, uh, which is very important in the um, history of early modern economics as a battle between two kinds of mercantilism uh, and uh, about the concept of free trade. And just 20 years later, we find on Cyprus those uh, uh, East India Company merchants happily being together with the Levant merchants. Because around 1750, winners and losers had been settled. The Levant Company had lost and had been forced to open its ranks in 1753, abolishing the prior definitions of a free merchant, the necessity to be a British subject to be allowed to enter the company. And the Asia trade had surpassed the Levant trade, while the British had lost grounds in the Mediterranean against the French. Seen before the background, we understand that the travel account of those East India Company agents placed it and eaves through the Mediterranean is tacitly bearing testimony of this new settlement of the situation. Trade and commerce in the Levant was slowed down somewhat and the Englishmen still living there for a while or for a longer time transformed to some extent into multitasking political cultural agents of early, the early global British Empire. This turns now the attention to the merchants own culture abroad as the last point. How they were orienting themselves. Obviously Uh, we see from those 18th century travel accounts they were now well performing Frenchness and Britishness abroad. They were themselves showing their Levantine host country to visitors, dining with them, enjoying cabaret, music and other forms of playful culture abroad. Were they reading and using themselves travel accounts and similar literature as a form of an early modern tourist guide to their environment? A comprehensive analysis of the content of French and British Levant merchants' libraries in its development over time is still a task for the future. We're just doing that in a very tiny project. Uh, I'm starting that uh, with the German funding now. However, some first remarks are possible. George Wakeman's household belonging in his library are registered in the Aleppo Chancery as they were sold after his death in auction by the very consul Alexander Drummond, where you see his signature here, who wrote also one of those Sephiroth uh, texts, and his chancellor Kirkhaus on July 7, 1747, and his library uh, one year later. The quite impressive library of 539 volume was sold for 567 pounds and is divided into French, English, Italian, Latin volumes and two thematic sections for theology and medicine. Wakeman's French books show him to be acquainted with more than the average of early Enlightenment literature, philosophy and theory. From the early French translations of Grotius' Traité de la Vérité de la Religion Chrétienne to the Pensée of Pascal, the Histoire du Cardinal Mazarin, Montesquieu's Lettres Persanes, much of the works of Boileau, Le Newtonisme pour les Dames, The Morale des Chinois, The uh, Aventure de Télémaque, The Histoire Naturelle des Insectes, certainly also Colbert, uh, Colbert Uh, Ordonnance uh, de Marine, like among the Italian books, the Consolato del Mare, are all present in the library, and the latter ones are matching well with George Wakeman's office as a consul because he had to be oriented certainly on uh, those uh, maritime laws. Um, Uh, there, uh, he, he was in English Woods, uh, recent ruins of Palmyra from 1753 uh, show him to be acquainted with the latest state of anti antiquarian research on those ruins, not far away from Aleppo, which had first of all been investigated by la late 17th century members of the <coughs> Aleppo factory as William Halifax. So what has been destroyed, as we all know, uh, by the Islamic uh, fundamentalists had just been uh, first brought into the European heritage memo uh, memoir or collective memory by uh, Levant merchants like uh, William Halifax and then uh, uh, John Wood uh, and had be been described first by those people and uh, the Levant merchants themselves had certainly those books in their libraries and were orienting it and so far on their own environment in the Levant by uh, sources written by uh, uh, John Wood or by Thomas Smith or Abednego Sella on Palmyra. 
Bale's Dictionary we find, and the works of Alexander Drummond, we find Milton's Paradise Lost, Shaftesbury's Characteristics, 16 volumes of The Spectator, the independent Wick uh, uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs, Tillotson and Pearson for Theology. And we find the map of commerce of uh, Louis Roberts that I just used as a source myself. So uh, all in all, it makes, I cannot repeat here the whole list, but these books already enumerated, uh, we see that uh, his theologic, uh, theological uh, works suggest that George Wakeman uh, belonged politically rather to the big strand. Yeah, just one. That he belonged politically rather to the Whig strand in the religious terms, he was probably Presbyterian, eventually even close uh, to the Quakers. This would be coherent with the tradition to be found in the Boddington family, as the diary of the elder George Boddington shows him already to be a very devout believer, changing and choosing his Presbyterian parish and preacher very consciously, and being abhorrified uh, by the Catholicism by, of uh, Charles II. Uh, later, Boddington was then Freemason, and Alexander Drummond, his uh, friend, was also Freemason, and he was founding lodges of Freemasonry across the Lee event in, in that time. We don't know if George Wakeman himself was a, me, uh, a Freemason. However, as far as I see of all the works, and now to be uh, a little bit give a little bit of deception into the room. <laughs> However, as far as I see, of all the works of the Sephiroth project uh, that were identified as the Cyprus-related uh, Cyprus early modern travel account library, Wakeman was not possessing even one, though living on that island and serving apparently for decades to visitors to show them the country. However, he possessed the memoir of Darvieux, an important travel account of that time, and he possessed uh, the description of the world by and Walter Raleigh's uh, travels. I looked then in other library records, not for Cyprus merchants, but of Levant merchants in Constantinople, Pera, uh, uh, Aleppo, Smyrna, to look if there we find Cyprus uh, books. And just to conclude, uh, we have here, of the uh, Sephiroth collection, we find Jean Thévenot's travels into the Levant, George Sandy's travels, Thomas Herbert's some years' travels into the diverse parts of Asia, Henry Moundre's companion of a journey from Aleppo to uh, Jerusalem, Manslow, Oliarius, Edison, uh, Saint-Georges, and Drummond. That's all I could find as a matching uh, between the content of the libraries of the merchants themselves and the Severus project as that. The other thing is that they possessed very large parts of Greek and ancient Latin authors, often in contemporary translation, which are only a tiny part of the Severus project at the time. But in the 18th century, it seemed uh, the, vice versa. The English Thucydides and Hobbes translation in Wakeman's library is no exception, but many ancient historians, Herodotus, Pliny, Livy, the geographers, Ptolemy, Strabo, uh, uh, and literature authors are sometimes far more important than works of the present times and than the travel accounts and on the present state of the country in its woman and man. This leads to the su uh, suggestion that many of them traveled through the Greek islands as well as through other parts of the Levant with antiquarian glasses, which is evident in the text on the Severus platform itself and the travel accounts with their large antiquarian sections, collections, epigraphs, coins, medals, drawings, and describing ruins and statues. And those section sections of the merchant libraries show the educated bourgeois merchant of the 18th century to be also often a connoisseur of the classical authors for those purposes. Perhaps one might add several representative early modern editions of those classical authors mentioning Cyprus still to Sephiroth uh, as uh, were uh, in the libraries. Specific research question would be on how Plinian, Ptolemy and Strabus, and then also medieval Arabic glasses were guiding the travelers might lead to questions where the travel account can be deciphered as palimpsest of ancient texts, sometimes referring explicitly, but often rather governed by some patterns recurring topo uh, of the ancient uh, authors. And by the material culture, the material history of book possession would be linked with the history of perceptions and the reconstructions of how the past long-term or temporary inhabitants, the learned or unlearned voyagers, were perceiving differently the Mediterranean and again differently through time. So uh, Robert Lewis, uh, Lewis Roberts is uh, perceiving his Mediterranean 
synchron synchronically very different and diachronically very different from a George Wegman, though both still belong to the same Levant company, both are Protestant Anglicans, but there's, uh, the Mediterranean has much changed in their subjective rendering in, in, in their eyes, but we don't know much about that because that has not so much studied, and a platform like Sepphoris is important for that in the study of the book possession, is it also. So, thank you for that. Thank you very much, uh, Colonel, and uh, uh, we are very glad to know that you have been digging all of these uh, documents that are going to give us a totally different understanding of Europe and perhaps the economy of Europe, um, as we learned just now about the stock market and the Levantine and East India Company. We would like to know more about all of that.